And good afternoon to everyone. My name is Brendan Donahue. I'm the Technology Manager at CJCA. And uh, before we begin today's presentation, I want to go through some quick housekeeping issues with everybody that's joining. Uh, we have a lot of people registered today, and the attendees are still joining in here. So let me do some quick notes on using today's webinar. First off, on your audio, everybody that's joining today is going to be muted. We don't have any open phone lines. Uh, but I want you to ask questions, and I'll show you how to do so in just a second. Because we're muted, if you're having any problems with your audio, your sound, you, there's two different options for joining today, and that's to listen on your telephone or listen on, through your computer microphone and speakers. Uh, if you've got your computer speakers and telephone on at the same time, make sure you choose the telephone option on your computer screen. That will really reduce any unwanted sounds or feedback. A copy of today's presentation will be emailed to you. So if you're looking for the slides, want to know if there's a copy of this going to be available, it will be available in a link in a follow-up email. And also in that email will be a copy of the video recording. Today's webinar will be recorded for future viewing. If there's material that you see here today and you want to refer to some, somebody to it in the future, we'll give you the link so that you can share it with them. Now I said I want you to ask questions, and we won't have the phone lines open, so you'll have to type them in on the webinar control panel. And I've got an image up on the screen so you can see how to do so. Type in your questions at any point throughout the presentation. We're going to be holding questions until the end of the webinar, until the end of the session. We've left plenty of time for questions at the end. But make sure that as you see slides or as you see things being mentioned and you want to ask questions to our panelists here today, Type them in here, and we'll answer them in the order in which they were received. And I know I want you to ask us some questions, but I'm going to start by asking you a question, and that is, how many people are attending the webinar here with you today? Uh, we had over 500 people registered, and you can click, you can answer this question by clicking directly on your screen and tell me uh, just how many people are there in the room with you. I know some people are joining from conference rooms where uh, you've got a projector set up, and there might be multiple people, maybe you've just got somebody looking over your shoulder, but we want to get an idea of who's out there attending. And thank you all for clicking on this brief poll. And so to begin in today's presentation, I'm going to hand things over to my left where I've got Ned Lovren, Executive Director of CJCA. Ned's going to start us off here. Ned? Thank you, Brendan. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Center for Coordinated Assistance to the States webinar, Reducing the Use of Isolation in Juvenile Confinement Facilities. As Brennan said, my name is Ned Loughran. I'm the Executive Director of the Council of Juvenile Correctional Administrators, better known as CJCA. And joining us from San Diego is Michael Lumpierre, who is working with CJCA on the, what we call the CCAS training. So when you hear me say CCAS, it's short for the Center for Coordinated Assistance for the States. Uh, the CCAS Training and Technical Assistance Project. The Center for Coordinated Assistance to the States was developed last year with a grant from the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. The purpose of the center is to assess the need for and coordinate the delivery of training and technical assistance designed to build capacity within states, territories, tribal units, and communities to maximize the effectiveness of juvenile justice systems to the benefit of the youth they serve. The focus of the center is on providing ongoing coaching to achieve individual or behavioral changes that positively impact the juvenile justice system. The American Institutes for Research, AIR, serves as the lead partner on CCAS, working collaboratively with the Council of Juvenile Correctional Administrators and the Center for Juvenile Justice Reform at Georgetown University. CJCA is the lead partner on reducing isolation in youth facilities training and technical assistance program. We send a special welcome to the participants of this program who are present on the webinar today. Today's learning, we have, we have um, several uh, or three learning objectives for today's webinar. One is to increase knowledge about the impact isolation has on youth facility residents. The second is to highlight key steps to reducing or eliminating isolation in detention and correctional facilities. And third, to present real life examples 
on how facilities have reduced the use of isolation. So why focus on isolation? The performance-based standards definition of isolation and the one that CJCA uses is any time a youth is physically and or socially isolated for punishment or for administrative purposes. We intentionally exclude protective and medical isolation in that definition. Research has shown that placing a youth in isolation has negative public safety consequences, does not reduce violence within facilities, and can harm youth psychologically, physically, and developmentally. CJCA has a position on isolation. CJCA believes that isolating or confining a youth in his or her room should be used only to protect the youth from harming him or herself or others, and if used, should be for a short period of time and supervised. Our topic today is one that CJCA and the Performance-Based Standards Initiative has been working on for most of the 20 years of our existence, and we are really pleased to see that reform is taking place in this area across the country now more than ever before. The impetus for today's webinar began last October at the CJCA Leadership Institute when more than 40 CJCA members, the State Directors of Youth Corrections, spent the better part of two days discussing the use of isolation and resolved to develop a strategy to use the examples of youth correctional agencies that had significantly reduced its use to assist other agencies and reliance on isolation to manage facilities. In March of this year, CJCA published a toolkit reducing the use of isolation. You should have been able to download the toolkit when you registered for this webinar, and it's available on the CJCA website under publications. We welcome all of you, and we're really gratified that over 500 people, and it's probably even more when we find out how many people are, are joining around one computer, but all of you to today's webinar. But I would like to give a, a shout out to the teams from eight youth corrections jurisdictions that applied to CCAS to receive training and technical assistance to reduce the use of isolation in their facilities. They are the California Division of Juvenile Justice, the NIH at Urge and OH Close Youth Correctional Facilities, the Georgia Department of Juvenile Justice, the Minnesota Juvenile Correctional Facility Red Wing, the Nebraska Office of Juvenile Services, Kearney and Geneva Facilities, the Nevada, Nevada Juvenile uh, Services Division, the South Carolina Department of Juvenile Justice, the Washington State Juvenile Justice Rehabilitation Administration Green Hill Facility, and West Virginia's Division of Juvenile Services. We will be working with you and your teams over the next several months in helping you um, learn from the examples of some of the jurisdictions that will be speaking today who have been very successful in reducing the use of isolation, changing the culture in their facilities, and revising their policies and procedures, and monitor, monitoring them very carefully to make sure that isolation is reduced and virtually eliminated. So that brings us to the heart of today's presentation, um, our three presenters. Uh, they're all members of CJCA. Uh, they are Faraboy's Pak Suresh, the Director of the Oregon Youth Authority and Vice President of CJCA, Christine Blessinger, the Chief of Operations, the Indiana Division for Youth Services, and Peter Forbes, the Commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Youth Services and Chair of the CJCA Positive Youth Outcomes Committee. And so it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first panelist today, Fair Boys Pak Suresh from Oregon. Fair Boys? Thank you, Ned, um, and hi, everyone. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on what part of the country you're in. I think if you're in the uh, West Coast, we are still uh, just past 11 o'clock. Um, and thank you for being with us. I'm really excited that how many people have joined the webinar already. Um, let me begin by saying that uh, for the majority of us, whether we are juvenile justice directors, commissioners, managers, or practitioners, culture change seems to be a topic that we talk about and reflect on regularly. It is either on top of our agendas or someplace near the top. 
and perhaps the most important aspect of uh, organizational transformation. Uh, and when we talk about reducing or eliminating the practice of isolation, what we're really talking about is a major transformation in culture and mindset. And that is the importance of culture. What you see on the slide eight is a definition of culture by Richard Daft in a book that, that he wrote uh, titled Organizational Theory and Design. And how he defines culture is uh, the set of values, guiding beliefs, understanding, and ways of thinking that is shared by members of an organization and is taught to new members as correct. It represents the unwritten, healing part of the organization he says the purpose of culture is to provide members with a sense of organizational identity and values that are larger than themselves. So as change managers, what we face are shared values, beliefs, and identity. And changing or shifting these is a considerable undertaking. The question on slide nine is, um, why should we focus on culture change? Uh, and why can't we just change our policies and practices and forget about all this touchy feely stuff? So, um, maybe a little background about how our understanding and practices in juvenile justice have evolved over the course of the past 25 years or so. Uh, the collective understanding or wisdom in the early 1990s was that punishment, locking children in a room, and keeping them in isolation for days were effective in reforming juveniles who had committed offenses or crimes. Based on that belief and mindset, our system created new policies and procedures and implemented programs and interventions which moved us closer to an adult correctional culture. And then over the course of the past 20 or 25 years, a new body of knowledge has emerged about practices such as isolation. This knowledge is rooted in data science and research, and it introduced us to a different set of understanding about the negative effects of these practices and their impact on reforming juvenile delinquents. Those who work within the old paradigm have been indoctrinated, and not to uh, their own fault, but they've been indoctrinated in practices and processes that, for the most part, contrary to a developmental approach to youth reformation. The belief and the mindset associated with the old paradigm define the dominant culture in youth corrections. And moving to the new paradigm requires a shift in mindset and practices. As leaders and practitioners, we already know through experience that we can rewrite policies and procedures, develop desk manuals and practice models, issue directives and decrees, but if we are not able to shift those shared values, beliefs, and understanding that define the present culture, very little will change. And finally, as our understanding of the system and our role in creating better outcomes changes, our culture also needs to shift and change in order to align our operation with the new and emerging knowledge and understanding. Foc focusing on the culture allows us to do this. Uh, I want to talk for a moment about the importance of leadership um, and the critical and fundamental role that it plays in transforming organizations. I want to share with you several key roles for leaders in organizational transformation. First of those is that um, as leaders, we need to understand the impetus for change. In other words, what is motivating us to do this? Is there a burning platform? Is there outside pressure? The second um, key role is that as leaders, and again, when I say leaders, I'm not necessarily talking about you know, whether we're directors or commissioners. I think you can be in any role in the organization and play a leading, leading role in that organization. So I'm you know, lead, uh, referring to leadership in both of those um, paradigms. So um, we need to embrace the change. If we're leading a change, we need to be owning it as well. At the same time, we need to be able to understand the change and we need to be able to explain it to others. Why are we moving in this direction? 
and what is the price that you might pay for inaction. We always want to be ahead of the curve or ahead of the wave of change rather than being overtaken by it. And then finally, we have to have a strategy or a series of strategies for gradual movement of the mindset and culture to the new paradigm that we want to move into. We all know that change does not happen overnight. And to move the culture, we need to have clear and coherent strategies for change. So in the next series of slides, I want to share with you specifically five strategies for leaders in order to move and shift the culture. The first of those things is um, a strategy based basically to highlight why this change is needed both on the business front and the human front. So we have to make the business and the human case for change. And we need to be able to articulate a compelling case or why we seek to change the current practice. What is the human cost of continuing doing business as usual? For example, the trauma that could be inflicted on youth, potentially increasing the numbers of future victims and compromising the safety of the community. And at the same time, there's a fiscal impact and a monetary cost of continuing the current practice. For example, longer stay in youth correctional facility, potential transfer to adult prison, and the unquantifiable cost of future crimes and victims. On slide 12, uh, the strategy is to engage those who do the work in the transformation process. To implement change successfully and to transform culture, we as leaders need to win the hearts and minds of those who do the work we have to understand the difference between power and force. If using force is harmful to youth, forcing change upon the organization will have the same effect on staff. Staff will shift their mindset if they see the point of change, understand the change, and agree with it. It's not enough, and we all know this, just to tell our employees that they will have to do things differently. We must take the time to put a compelling compelling case together that makes sense to staff. Is the change going to improve safety? Is it going to create a more pleasant working environment? Is it going to create better future for youth? And of course, we need to involve our staff in the implementation process so that they, they can uh, make the change their own and take pride in the improvements that follow. On slide 13, this strategy is to provide the staff with tools, training, and skills that they need in order to shift to this new culture that we're demanding to create. Again, staff can't just be told to see the current practices without having something to replace it. They need tools, they need training and action learning to see what this new paradigm looks like. They have to know and trust that it works. Action learning is needed because this change is not going to happen through classroom teaching. Clearly, there is a theory behind this practice, and that could be taught in a classroom environment. But the staff need time to absorb the information, experiment with it, and improve it through time. We also need to expect and be prepared for setbacks and many challenges along the way. Additionally, balancing persistence and patience is important as we try to embed the change in the culture of the organization. The fourth strategy is uh, developing metrics and outcome measures in order to track and measure success. So setting targets, measuring performance, rewarding good behavior, and celebrating incremental success are all important to motivate the workforce and to be able to demonstrate the return on investment. Getting the organization focused on desired outcomes and results can be an effective way in shifting culture. And then on um, slide, let's see here, 15, if I can get there. But here we are. We must model the change that we want to implement. To change behavior and culture, Consistency in an organization, we as top leaders, as well as our executive team, 
our managers at every level of the, of the organization must walk the talk. Now, when I talk about leaders in this frame, I'm really talking about the top leadership of the organization because we cannot expect others in the organization to do what we do not model. How we treat staff um, how, as leaders and how effectively we listen to them translates directly or indirectly to how staff exhibit the same behavior with the youth in our care and custody. So let me share with you just a few additional thoughts. For me, the change process begins from the inside and moves to the outside. Before we take care of anyone, we must make sure that we are focused and balanced individually. So taking care of oneself becomes primary, and then we can move to staff. Now, for majority of us, the culture that we have within our organizations predates us by many years. In attempting to shift the culture, some staff may see us as just another flavor of the day or week or month or however they might perceive us. And those who are resistant to change may be fairly confident that they can outlast us and outlast the new initiative. And in most cases, they're correct. It's important to realize that change cannot be successfully implemented without a frontline staff. So taking care of the staff becomes one of the most important roles of leadership in organizational change. Every fight and assault, whether on staff or youth, has trauma associated with it for staff. If we fail to address the staff trauma and are not there for them, we cannot expect them to support the change process. And as I said earlier, how we treat staff translates into how youth are treated, and of course taking care of youth is our ultimate responsibility. I'm pleased to say that in Oregon Youth Authority, we are seeing steady and incremental progress on reducing isolation by implementing the strategies I shared with you in the last few slides. We have avoided top-down approach, we have gotten staff involved, have helped them understand why the change is necessary, we are providing tools and training aligned with principles of positive youth development. We have deployed coaches and living units to help model practice, which could prevent some situations that could lead to isolation, as well as helping youth who end up in isolation reintegrate back into their living unit. And we've established processes to measure success. And we have our leadership in facility services, our superintendents, our program directors, model the type of interactions that can lead to minimizing isolation. And finally, looking at isolation as in a silo is not going to give us the um, answers that we need. In fact, when we look at the toolkit that CJCA put out, we can see that it looks at isolation from a much broader lens. And that's the approach that we've adopted in Oregon. So that's the end of my slides. And I thank you for um, the... Um, Allowing me to share these thoughts with you, and I now turn it to turn it over to my colleague in Indiana, Chris Blessinger, to talk about specific strategies and actions they've implemented to reduce the use of isolation. Okay, thank you, Fairboard. Um, good afternoon and good morning for some of you. Um, and in order to reduce isolation, we had to change the overall culture in our facilities. And the biggest challenge to overcome was staff fear for safety, which would lead to the use of isolation. In the past, staff felt safe when they used isolation, and that was because we had a very, kind of a, a very adult-minded correctional division at the time. So kids would commit an act of aggression, and they would go to isolation for days. Um, we had a lot of the same policies and procedures as the adult facilities. So we had to change that. We looked at staff. We started aiming to hire staff that wanted to make a difference. Those staff, you know, who wanted to work with youth and wanted to help change the lives of kids. Uh, we changed the job title from correctional officers to youth developmental specialists and also changed their uniforms so that they would wear kind of like polo type shirts. We felt that was was kind of a more relaxed look. Staff also began to participate in more programming with the youth 
So kind of just being more of a part of the treatment process in general. Then we looked at the interview process. We implemented job shadowing so potential staff could see exactly what the job consisted of, you know, see where they would be working and, and what they would actually be doing. And then we started having the superintendents meet with each of the staff prior to offering the position to a potential employee. Uh, the superintendents would just, you know, discuss our mission, kind of get a feel for how that potential employee would fit into the facilities and the division. Then we started looking, looking at our training, and we began to implement training that focused on adolescent development. Staff need to be prepared to work with the youth that are experiencing, you know, the changes in their lives. Uh, as I said previously, we began to eliminate the focus that was on adult corrections, and we began focusing on our own division and, and kind of developed that. We came up with our own mission, uh, our own value statements, and we added an additional one week of only juvenile specific training, which we called our Making a Change Academy, MAC, Aca Mac Academy. Um, just so you know, our, our training academy for new staff now is combined with the adult staff for the first few weeks to address similar topics about working with offenders in general. Um, but we worked with our training division and, and for that time, and for the time that the staff was combined, we added to some of the topics an, an adult trainer and a juvenile trainer so that they could be co-teaching together, um, training the staff so there would be scenarios and examples for working with not only with adults but those scenarios working with youth. Then we added uh, one week of, of that additional training, which I called our, our MAC Academy, to focus on more specific training. For example, we added training on adolescent development. We added a full day of, tra uh, full day of trauma-informed care training. And this training, I can say, has tremendously helped staff understand to see, you know, to see the youth in a different light as victims of neglect or abuse. We implemented motivational interviewing for every single staff that works in our division. Um, and, and we also worked with them to teach staff how to utilize conflict resolution skills. And then that last point on the slide, we um, also developed a program, kind of a, a program slash training, and it's called our Joint Understanding and Cooperation Program. And this is actually a program where youth and staff work together. Um, the focus of this program is to show students how staff think, how staff think inside of a, a facility, but at the same time showing staff how students view their time in the facility. Uh, that training program is about, is, it lasts for three days. And the first two days, the staff and the students are separate and they focus on the importance of role modeling and redirecting behaviors. And then on the third day, the, the youth and staff come together and they discuss reinforcing positive behaviors. This gives the staff and the youth each other's perspectives of how each of their roles. Um, then, of course, we incorporated performance-based standards into the foundation and, and culture of our facilities, it, it kind of became our, our, way of doing, our way of doing business, really. Um, we share the data with all of our staff, which has helped them to understand the reasons behind the change. Um, you know, being able to see that we were way above the national average for isolation and the hours, we and then the hours of isolation we were way above the national average, I think was really impactful to the staff. Having them see how we looked compared to the other states and jurisdictions was also helpful. Um, that, that really helped with, with helping the attitudes for change. Um, currently, like our superintendents of our facilities will work different hours and 
um, meet with small groups of staff to show them all of the PBS reports and discuss with them the reports. You know, so they can give their input and help with the improvement plans by giving their ideas. We also conduct daily incident monitoring meetings where department heads um, of each facility get together and they discuss incidents um, to include uses of isolation from the day before. And they'll review them or to basically ensure that all the processes were in place and that every effort to keep youth out of isolation was used. Um, these meetings kind of give the staff the ability, the ability to discuss reasons that they might be aware of for the youth behavior and actions. We also focus on PDS data monthly and not just during PDS months. We have what we call um, a PDS report that each facility submits monthly with pretty much all of the P PDS outcome measures on it. So we can review it, we can celebrate successes, especially when it comes to decreasing isolation. And then we also would address areas that might be of problem or concern. I know I don't, I don't have a slide that talks, uh, that shows about my PDS data, but there was kind of one point about our data that I wanted to point out to you. Um, those of you who participate in PDS, one of the outcome measures is the average duration of isolation and room confinement and segregation and special management in hours. So our jurisdiction average in April of 2009, we had 24.1 hours of room confinement. So in October of 2014, we dropped to 6.24 hours. So that represents a 74% decrease um, in those hours. So, you know, this data just shows that some of the things, obviously the things that we implemented have worked. We, we also began to use families to help reduce isolation. We opened up our visitation days and hours to, so that we would have visits daily. Prior to this, we only offered visitation on specific days of the week or specific times of the week. Um, we implemented conference calls with families to discuss reasons for isolation. So, for example, if a youth is placed in isolation, um, we would contact the family and then do a family session over the phone so that the youth can discuss their behaviors with their family and the staff can also talk with the families. And then, you know, together they can collaborate on strategies to help the youth to make better decisions. We also started having collaborative family sessions with counselors and the juvenile reintegration specialists that we have, which that, that would be our juvenile parole staff. Uh, we created several different family events at each of our facility. Uh, for example, we offer family we have family councils. We offer tours for our, for our families. We have teacher parent conferences. We do some family days. Um, and one facility even has families that can attend some volunteer activities with the youth. We're always, all the time, trying to add new things for our families to participate in, to keep them engaged. To have a commitment to culture change, uh, we also implemented a few other things. We, we began to have more of a unit team concept where treatment staff and the youth developmental specialists would work very closely together, um, especially when it, when it came to the comes to the treatment teams for youth. Um, we started using conflict resolution with youth and then youth and staff in place of isolation. So like for example, if an incident occurs such as a fight, we would sit the two youth down together with a, with a staff mediator and you know, try to work that issue out. And most of the time it works and the youth will really just go back to normal activities. We started, um, an, another initiative that we call the CARE team. 
the crisis awareness response effort. And the care team is used as a first responder uh, with the purpose to de-escalate, to de-escalate a situation rather than um, we also have what we call a QRT team, which is our quick response team, who would typically respond to issues using having to use force. So that care team gives a staff, the staff person the ability to call for assistance and help with de-escalating new use, and sometimes the care team will be able to just take over for a staff and assist in de-escalating, um, especially if the youth is having issues with that particular staff during that time. Uh, we also instituted uh, what we call the staff shadow program in place of isolation. So if a youth is having difficulty adjusting or getting along with other youth, uh, we will place that staff person to be by their side for the day. So they would follow them to school, follow them to recreation, follow them to programs, um, you know, anything that they're doing for that day. We have also started um, family count or students. Sorry, we've also started student councils at each of our facilities so that the youth would have a voice. Um, one of the biggest things that we were able to do at one of our facilities was completely close down a segregation unit, and we turned it into a transitional living unit. In fact, we have actually reduced our segregation beds pretty much at all of our facilities and even at one facility one facility operates and has only has one isolation room and, and has always only had one isolation room um, so that is pretty much all of my points and concludes what what I was going to talk about but if I could give some advice um, if you're you know wanting to take if you're wanting to make these changes, take things slow and don't try to make all the changes at once um, because staff will be overwhelmed and they won't buy into the change. So just take it slowly and make changes. Um, so now I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Peter. Good afternoon. I'm going with afternoon. Uh, this is Peter Forbes. Um, generally, if I'm presenting, I like to go first and get it out of the way. But today, I'm actually fortunate to have to be going third because I think Fairboys and Chris did a really nice job setting up um, some of the uh, dynamics that are really important in trying to make this kind of a change. And in Massachusetts, we took this on really starting around 2007. So we're um, eight years into it, and um, I don't propose that, that we fixed it. We've made some changes, but we're continuing to try to work through a really dense, important practice in, in the agency. So from, from a messaging standpoint, my, my presentation is going to be a little more, probably a little more practical. Um, on the ground. From a messaging standpoint, we, we had to try to figure out how to do a version of what Chris is, was, was describing, which is get people on board. And one of the first things that we had to do was dispel the myth that putting kids in their rooms creates safety. And in, in our experience, there, there's a, a, a major issue with safety when kids go in their rooms and that some of the impulsivity that goes on and some of the acting out that goes on when kids go in their rooms is also something that has to be very much um, considered in the equation. So safety, yes, is very important. Room confinement is not the, the resolution to safety. It's, it's a tool if used appropriately. The other piece of it was really, and we're, we still have, this is a big you know, high-level messaging across a lot of different venues in the agency, but the idea that if we're really going to be, all of us, outcome focused and we want youth to be in better shape when they leave us than when they came to us, 
then they have to they have to participate in programming. And we can't have kids in their rooms for prolonged periods of time, missing school, missing clinical groups, missing a lot of the pro-social pro activities that we're trying to deliver. So it's fundamentally important for kids to be safe, staff to be safe, and kids to be engaged in programming. And the, I call it room confinement. That practice has to support those objectives. So that was that, that's some of the framework as far as trying to take this on with staff. Um, we, we decided early on that we weren't going to be able to talk our way through this, this type of change, that we needed really to have um, policy, and we needed to have data, and we needed to have training, and we needed to have quality assurance. So one of the things that we, we took on was we really took on the policy the issue, and this is not the kind of policy that can go out on and just go out on an email or be dropped into staff's um, mailbox or to be presented by a shift soup at a, at, a, at a shift change meeting. This is something that has to come out at a senior level of the agency. And I think, you know, my, my, my advice on this after having gone through it is the, the message is important and the messenger is as important. And that the lower into your agency that that message gets delivered, the less likely you are to be long-term successful. That there has to be some leadership ownership of this. And it can't be just pushed down the line as a memo that, we're changing a practice. It has to be much more deliberate than that. And my experience in policy implementation is that there are policies maybe once or twice a year in, in, in agencies that you have to take on and be really thoughtful about how you deliver that message. And this is one of them. Um, so the policy implementation, the policy itself, getting people around the table and letting people have input and talk it through and understand it is really important. And then the actual rollout is an opportunity to actually make that engagement, that initial engagement with staff on what you're trying to accomplish. So, and there's a number of ways to do that. Uh, we spent, you know, the better part of a year, and we were real careful when we rolled this particular policy out that we didn't make it effective immediately. We built in, a, I believe it was a 90-day window strictly for the implementation. So the policy was signed, but it became effective 90 days later. So we had an opportunity to get it out there um, and have people essentially recognize that the, that the reality around this practice was changing, and then ultimately the implementation date kicked in, which was another, another piece that actually worked for us. Um, the biggest piece, so I'm on slide 25, the number 25. Uh, we, the biggest piece that we did really was, uh, was to take punishment off the table. We were very, very careful about messaging, and we're still doing this to this day, messaging that room confinement is available as a tool to quell a violent situation or an out-of-control situation, and that it's really important in messaging this that you probably lead with that before you say, but it can't be used for punitive purposes. And practice in Massachusetts prior to this policy shift was if there was a fight, particularly if a, a kid pushed a staff member, they'd go to their room, they'd get their hearing, and they'd get 24 hours in their room or 48 hours in their room. Well, we took that away, and we took that away in writing in the policy. And that's not, that was not easy to do. It was um, not well received throughout the agency, and we really had to, Chris talked about patience, and Fairboys talked about persistence and patience. We really had to be patient about how we were going to make this happen, but we had to, we had to maintain a level of persistence or we weren't going to get it done. So we went the policy route. The other piece of the Massachusetts policy, which is available for folks if you, if you want to take a look at it, is we put checks and balances in so that there's a certain amount of program level discretion around room confinement, and then as kids would actually spend time in their room, you have to call up the management chain to get further authorization. And for us, that was really a, it's a great way to share that responsibility with the programs, but it's also a way to hold the programs accountable, that they're not going to pick the phone up and ask for additional time in the room if it's not warranted. Okay. I hope I'm not going too fast here. I don't know. So data, you know, so the policy was huge for us. 
the data was as big because when we started this out in somewhere around 2008, 2009, we didn't have baseline data. We just didn't know who were, who, who were in there, which kids were in their rooms and what programs and for how long. We didn't have that data. It wasn't something that we were collecting. So we cobbled together our kind of initially a primitive uh, phone call system where all of our programs were required to call into a particular location every night. And then we started to assemble a manual Excel that went out to senior managers so we could see it on a regular basis. That was the beginning of the transparency and the accountability about who's in their room, how long are they in their room, who put them in their room, why did they go to their room, and what kind of authorization was required. And we've moved now over a period of years toward an end user system where we have a new MIS system in the same window from 2008 to 2015 where at the program level they enter the data that puts the kid, that shows that the kid is in their room and every morning we pick that up so that pretty much every manager, at least on the residential side of the agency up to myself, open up what we call a room confinement report every day and we can see nobody was in their room yesterday or six kids were in their room, what programs um, those kids were in, how long they stayed, who authorized it, and the reason that they went in their room, and it's all coded in. And the good news on that, if you can get to that kind of a model, is then you can start to run reports and start to query and really look at how that's being managed across the agency. Um, that was a tough one, and you know that's another one. That's another the data collection and being able to really see this issue requires, if you don't have it in place, it's going to require patience and persistence in that when you see a particular program is using a lot of room confinement, that you're careful about how you call in and try to figure out what's, what's going on rather than it's a bad thing. It may, it may be warranted. It, it, it may be a situation where there are other things going on in that program and room confinement. And, and you may see what we've seen in Massachusetts is you'll see room confinement you'll see restraint, you'll see assault, you'll see serious incident reports all generating out of particular programs, which means you have to reach in and there's something going on, react to that in a way that's supportive. Um, but it's generally, for us, in my perspective, it's not just room confinement. And the other piece on data before I turn the page is it's really helpful, and this goes to the PBS, I think PBS is on my next slide, it's really helpful for all of the programs to be able to see how they look up against the like, like programs in the system. So I put this slide in, um, I asked Michael to put this slide in as really more of an exhibit to make the point that when we started, we didn't know what a good practice would look like. What's a, what's a lot of room confinement? and what's, a, what's an acceptable level of room confinement. PBS is one place where you can kind of look at that model and try to figure out where you match up. And this slide shows Massachusetts against um, the national group on one measure. If Kim were here, she'd kick me because I'm not sure what measure that is, uh, but it's the number of room confinements. And so when, when we started looking at the PBS data in, in the context of what we were trying to do, it was reassuring that we were in pretty good stead, but we didn't come out. One of the things I would caution you against from a leadership stand, uh, standpoint is setting hard goals because what you'll find is if you either try to eliminate this right off the bat um, or, or set hard goals on minimizing it, then you'll find that you're going to have problems in other places like assaults on staff, more restraints, maybe more invasive things going on than just room confinement. And my experience in this is I would much rather have a kid go in his room than have him go into a full-blown mechanical restraint. So we have to be careful about how we uh, wade in on this because this room confinement practice is really enmeshed in all the other um, activities and um, measures that you take on the behavior management um, front in your program. So that, that's, I think that's my perspective on that. So one of the things that I'm sure people are wondering is, if not room confinement, what? 
and that's you know huge. I'll be honest that we really didn't have that piece of it put together in a comprehensive way. We took it away. We also at somewhere right, and it was somewhat coincidental. We we chose dialectical behavioral therapy. That's not something that I'm necessarily marketing or advertising on, but we chose that as a modality that would help kids manage themselves. It's been very helpful. And that, that became part of our overall strategy in getting kids to be able to manage themselves, putting a real premium on um, staff client engagement. We moved away from, and this is, we're still in the process of doing this, we've moved away from the, you get up with 100 points in the morning and you lose points all day, you know, from a kid's standpoint, that that, that became a real toxic um, arrangement for certain kids that couldn't manage. Some kids can handle that kind of a system very well and some kids can't. And those tended to be the kids that wound up acting out and potentially winding up in their rooms. So we've moved to a much more positive incentive-based program and done a lot of training behind that. The other, the other piece that we, we worked on was the issue, and this is something if you're going to take this on that I would, I would um, advise you to think about ahead of time, what are you going to do when that kid calms down? How are you going to assess that they're ready to come out and what are you going to do when they're ready to come out? And do you have the ability to do something between being locked in the room and being in the TV room having a slice of pizza? There has to be something in the middle and you have to have strategies that allow you to get kids out of their rooms and reality test that they're ready to take the next step. And we spent a lot of time, we spent the better part of a year on that, and it was one of the strategies that we used with our local. So our workforce is organized, and we worked with our union on the exit strategy. They were particularly interested in that. And it was a great, um, it was a great way for us to get to the table and work together on part of the resolution of this, and that was one of the pieces that we spent time on. So I'm right back. How am I doing on time, Brett? You're good. Perfect. Okay. Um, so Chris talked a lot about staff training. We've done a version of that too. Um, in our uh, in-service training, which staff get at, at the point of hire, we do um, two weeks of in-service in training, and then we do an annual research. We've ins inserted over the last few years positive youth development, a big piece on the adolescent brain and how that fits with development, motivational interviewing. We haven't gotten that all the way through our workforce, but that's on a list of things that we're working on, and we've done a fair amount of that. Um, we have a suicide prevention policy that we that is very relevant to room confinement. A lot of the self-harm that happens to kids happens in their rooms, and a lot of times the doors are locked when they do that and they're either impulsive or depressed or somewhere in between. So our suicide prevention policy is part of our in-service and it's part of our annual research. And we've really tried to um, do a lot of work with staff so that they can understand that this is actually a juvenile justice system and not the adult criminal justice system and that kids are different and that we have to react to the behavior but we have to be careful not to overreact to their behavior. And that's really where um, some staff are just better suited or more mature than others, and we have to continue to work on that. Um, and one, one other piece that I would uh, add before I um, turn it over is um, the whole PREA process has actually been, in its own way, has been very helpful to us because PREA is really about keeping kids safe and creating safe environments for kids that are, that are in custody, and we've used PREA um, as a further safety measure, measure in our, in our um, overall platform, and it's been very helpful. So I'll close basically the same way Chris closed, that this is going to take, if you're starting today, this is going to take some time, but you need policy, you need data, you need a training strategy, you have to take it on from a leadership standpoint, and you have to get your managers throughout your agency to be on board because if you have ma uh, managers in the chain of command that blink and don't want to take this on, and don't want to support the agency and the change, then you're not going to be successful. So you have to get it all the way through the workforce, and I wouldn't take your management teams for granted. I think you have to do a fair amount of work there, too. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Ned. Yes, thank you, Peter. Uh, 
Thank you to all three of our presenters, uh, Fairboys, Chris, and Peter. Um, I think all of you who have been participating in this webinar see that uh, it, it takes a lot of preparation, a lot of planning, a lot of training. Uh, it's, it's not an easy uh, task to change a culture, especially a culture that is used to managing kids by getting them out of your site for your shift. And so therefore, um, I feel the, the knowledge that's in, that has been shared with you today and, and what we've tried to capture in the toolkit um, will really help you as you, uh, as you strategize yourself and try to change your own systems. We have gotten several questions uh, while we've been uh, hearing the presentations, and so I'd like to uh, begin with a couple of them. And um, I'll try to direct, uh, direct it to one of the specific presenters, or maybe if it's so open-ended, I, I will just open it up to all the uh, presenters. But uh, Patricia in Connecticut uh, mentioned that, that Connecticut utilizes TCI, which I jumped out of the room to see if I could find out what TCI is, but I didn't. But, I, but also PBIS, and I do know PBIS, that's positive behavioral intervention and supports. And PBIS is a behavior management system, and a number of the CJCA jurisdictions are using PBS. I know Illinois is, I know Utah is, and uh, several others. Um, it is not a measurement system, it is a behavior management system, and it complements PBS, performance-based standards, which is a measurement system. It complements that very, very nicely. Well, anyway, Connecticut uses TCI and PBIS strategies to de-escalate and interact with juveniles. Are there, evidence, are there other evidence-based interventions to consider in reducing wound confinement? So since Peter is sitting right next to me, I'm going to turn to Peter first. Um, if there, if, are you aware of any other evidence-based interventions to consider in reducing the use of isolation? I don't, I mean, aside from the fact that I, I mentioned, and DVT is actually recognized um, as a promising practice, I believe, um, that, has, that has some um, consensus in different jurisdictions that are using DVT. We've had a fair amount of success with that, and it's not a direct connection to uh, reducing room confinement, but it, it, it is a behavior management strategy or a it's a cognitive skill development strategy with kids for them to be able to modulate themselves. And you know, I think the best, the best answer to minimizing room confinement is to run a great program. So there's a lot of evidence-based right. programming that we should keep our eye on the ball because the better our programs are, the less acting out we have and the less kids we have in their rooms. But I don't know of a lot of evidence-based room confinement reduction or isolation reduction techniques. Um, when Barry Studley was the commissioner, uh, the associate commissioner for juvenile services in Maine, uh, Barry used um, a, a terrific uh, person from uh, Harvard University, uh, Ross Green, who developed um, collaborative problem solving. And um, that was very effective in uh, reducing the use of isol uh, isolation. Well, I know that uh, Farivores, you use collaborative problem solving. And so. Uh, would you just speak very uh, briefly to how that, uh, which I believe is, have, has evidence behind it in terms of being able to diffuse and de-escalate situations and obviously reduce the use of restraints or isolation? Uh, yes, thank yes, you, Ned. Thank you. Yeah, actually yeah. both collaborative problem solving and motivational interviewing. And um, I believe that um, Chris and Peter may be using both of those. Um, um, but again, just going back to Peter um, and what he said, uh, much more than uh, the program being evidence-based or not, is how is it delivered and by whom. Um, the, the model that we're using today in Oregon, which collaborative problem solving and motivational uh, interviewing fits within, is what we call positive human development, which is really just a minor modification of the positive youth development concept, but with the approach that when you're talking about developing and learning, it's not just uh, for you, it's actually for all of us. And it is based on a few different principles of um, starting with safety and security and then, you know, building to that by caring and supportive relationships 
and at the same time not compromising on high expectations and accountability, having everyone, including staff and youth, participate in a meaningful way, and ultimately building to reconnect youth back to the community. So that's the model that we're using in Oregon. Um, I'm not sure if it is evidence-based as far as you know research. Uh, I know that positive youth development um, is a major initiative for CJCA, and most of our uh, members are using it. Uh, you know, the, the other things that we're doing within our facilities, again, there are many different tools that can help to reduction of isolation. Uh, we are actually doing nonviolent communication training for you. Uh, giving them a set of skills that they need in order how to resolve a conflict in a different way. So, um, you know, I, at the same time, I'm very open to learn from others, um, and you know, I will look at what is CBP net, the okay. intervention that Connecticut is using. Uh, TCI and PBIS. TCI. Okay. Great. So I will look into those and see if we can learn something from that here in Oregon. Great. If we find um, some information on TCI, we will put it on our website so everyone can um, can see that. Um, here's a question from Pauline. It's a kind of a double question, and uh, Chris, I'm going to direct uh, these two questions to you. Um, well, one comes from Pauline and one comes from Mandy, but they are related. Um, you talked about the uh, hiring qualified staff, um, Chris, and the, the question from Pauline is, we all know it's lower pay than they could make elsewhere in the county, city, or private organizations. Uh, and I, when I visited Chris's facilities not too long ago, uh, one of the plants, I'm forgetting which plant it was, but they, the recession was over and they were rehiring, and Chris lost a lot of staff from one of her facilities because uh, there were more uh, better paying jobs available in the plants that had cut back during the recession. So that, that's a challenge that um, I'd like Chris to address. And then the second one, Chris, is to, uh, the other part of it is uh, what training are you providing to your staff regarding dealing with de-escalation and managing uh, aggressive and defiant behavior? So if you want to start with the, 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 uh, the staff um, hiring and retention issue that you, I know you've been dealing with. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you, too. That's still, that still can be an issue in all of our facilities. Um, you know, our staff turnover is, is still high because of, of that reasons at times. But, um, you know, we, I think that's where that staff shadow really comes into play too because then they can come in and they can really see what they're doing and then that gives us the opportunity to really try um, to, you know, to let them know what they're going to be doing and how they're going to be helping the kids and, and what they're going to be able to, to see. Um, so it, it, it still is challenging. So it, it, that is kind of a hard question for me to answer because I don't want to tell you that that problem is completely fixed. Um, but staff training-wise, um, for that whole week that we do the Making a Change Academy, we, um, we provide that whole week of just working with youth. So it's how to manage adolescent behavior. We also give them training on PBS. We have the trauma-informed care training. We also, um, at the last day of that week, week we have a training that's called coaching in action with youth and that whole day is scenario based so the, the staff kind of gets the opportunity to deal with all kinds of different scenarios um, on how to deal how to deal with youth whether it's if a kid is has just been in a fight or is fighting um, whether a kid is su suicidal and what they say, how, how to deal, deal with them and what to say to them. So I think that whole week of that Making a Change Academy ha really helps with, um, with our staff. Okay. Great. Thanks, uh, Chris. Um, this is the, the obvious question that, we, that um, I'm not surprised we're getting. So, um, and then Peter uh, did talk about um, when isolation is used, um, 
again, according to policies and procedures, and making it as brief as possible. But Carrie asks, are there any reasons where a youth does need to be isolated? And we presume this is beyond to um, to stop the youth from hurting him or herself or someone else, where the kid is out of control and needs to get under control. I think everyone understands that. But um, are there any other reasons when a youth needs to be isolated? Uh, do you have any examples, maybe from recent history in your in your facilities? I, I if, if it's an individual kid, and we get beyond calming them down, I would argue that anything that needs to happen could happen in another part of the facility. It wouldn't have to happen behind a, a locked door. I'm not sure if I'm hitting this qu question correctly, but I don't see beyond calming the situation down legitimately. And that may take a half hour, that may take 45 minutes, that may take a full hour, that may take longer than an hour, depending upon what's going on with the kid and what the dynamics are. Um, but if there's a real prolonged concern about what's going on, once we get to putting the kid in their room, we if, if there's clinical support available in the building, which it generally is during the week, um, we want to get a licensed clinician into the dialogue with that kid and if, if a youth needs to be separated from the population for, for a particular concern, we try to use other parts, whether it's a day room or a hallway, uh, rather than a locked room, where they would have one-on-one -on -one supervision so we could figure out what's going on and strategize how to get them back into programming. Okay. Um, Fair boys or uh, Chris, do you want to add anything to Peter's? No, I would I would just I would agree with a lot of what Peter said, obviously. Um, one of the things that we do too is that if a kid does have to be placed in isolation, then I mean we're gonna be reviewing them like every hour. So we're gonna review them every hour and you know, like he said, it may take one hour, sometimes it may take two to three hours to get them before they they're calmed down enough to come out, but like Peter said, we also in, involve the mental health staff with that. Okay, good. Fair boys? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. We also have qualified mental health therapists and staff and psychologists that regularly check um, on the youth, and you know, in addition to the 15-minute checks that we have to do by policy uh, to make sure that, you know, youth is not left alone. Um, and, you know, and the other question that was asked, are there any circumstances where, um, you know, you, other circumstances where youth might be isolated? You know, we have a check in Oregon because all of us living units, with the exception of our um, the special needs living unit is dormitory setting. And sometimes, you know, in, in the environment of having to live with 24 other youth, some youth really want that. Um, privacy and so it's interesting at times you know you either ask or do things that actually make them go to a room and to, to just have that privacy we had one situation where the youth was on the verge of being paroled he only had two days to go and because of some of the issues and specifically gang issues that was happening in the facility he was not sure that if he could manage his own behavior or you know others might be targeting him so he actually asked to be isolated for two days be put in our isolation unit so that you could stay safe and, you know, no incidents would happen prior to his release. So, I mean, it just came to my mind to answer that question. That is a unique um, situation that happened. Okay. Um, Meg asks, in addition to reductions in the use of isolation, was there also a reduction in unnecessary physical interventions or uses of force with, uh, with youths? And I think we could also throw in uh, the use of um, mechanical restraints. So um, why don't I start with uh, Chris. Yeah. Um, have you seen a re reduction alongside of the um, use of isolation, also the reduction of the, the uh, physical um, interventions? Um, oh, ab absolutely. Yes, definitely. Everything, um, even all the, all the PBS outcome measures, we've seen a reduction because when you work on one thing, you kind of, all of the rest of the areas tend to decrease. So, yeah, I mean, most definitely. Yeah, I think it's logical that there is an interdependence among the, um, among the various um, uses of um, 
control in facilities, so that's good to hear. Um, Doug uh, asks, does anyone have an objective tool or a checklist to use to assess or determine when it is safe to return a youth to programming, or are you relying on the subjective assessment of staff following a conflict resolution process? Um, Peter? So that's an, ex that's an excellent question. Um, when we originally wrote our policy, we had um, we listed a series of questions that we advise as, as a potential guide to ask kids if they were ready to come out. And after a period of time, the feedback we got was that some of the kids could recite the questions and essentially mimic the fact that they were ready to come out. So we don't have an objective tool. We've done, um, you know, we trust that our staff have a fair amount of life experience and have good, good judgment and discretion and are able to do some level of assessment. The clinical staff obviously combined to help that. I don't have anything um, that I, I, I'm certainly not aware of anything that would be um, validated and objective in, in that arena, but it's, it's an excellent question and it is something you have to spend some time on. Okay. Um, so, Fairbrooks, uh, on the same question, uh, do you use a checklist or is it, again, a, uh, an assessment? that the uh, staff makes? Uh, I am not aware of a checklist. I believe it's an assessment that happens with participation of clinical staff and, uh, you know, the staff, the, the security staff, uh, with, and I think, you know, that is made jointly. So um, if there is a tool I'm not aware of, it, I clearly can look into it. And, you know, we can make that available if we have one. Okay, Chris. Yeah, we don't, we don't we don't use an actual tool like he's like Fairboard said. The mental health may have specific things that they might be asking, but I think our biggest thing is just checking to make sure that the kids have calmed down, that um, you know they that they're ready to go back to normal activities. Yeah, I think it's your system. Um, if I recall uh, one of Mike's presentations, Mike Dempsey, um, that you try to get a staff member who has a relationship with the youth um, from, a, from a, maybe another part of the building to bring them over to try to work with the youth in terms of getting the kid um, calmed down and back out. Yeah, yeah, and even a lot of times um, we'll even ask the kid, is there is there anybody that you would feel more comfortable talking with? And, and we'll find that person if that person is available. Okay, and uh, Dixie would like you to explain a little more about CARE, what, what CARE stands for again, and, oh. um, and Andy also asked how many are on the CARE team. Okay, um, well, as far as the CARE team is, it's called Crisis Awareness Response Effort, and the purpose, and as far as numbers are concerned, it would basically depend on uh, what facilities that you're at so, um, you know, one facility, it, we try to have uh, two to three members on there, and we also try to, to make it a variety of different staff. So sometimes it could even be, um, you know, a secretary that works in the facility. It could be a counselor, and then maybe somebody, um, an officer that works in another, that, I don't know, just, and then another correctional officer could be a recreation leader, it could be anybody, but each facility will develop a schedule about who is on that care team. Um, and so, that I mean, it's, it's that team that's called, so instead of calling that quick response team, they're calling that care, that care team to come during any kind of situation. Um, you know, for example, if a kid is um, in the classroom and maybe he's throwing a fit or standing up or he's pacing or doesn't want to sit down and the teacher's asking him to sit down, then if that teacher can't get him to cooperate, then they'll call the care team that kind of maybe removes that, that teacher out of the situation and that care team comes in and talks to and talks to the kid and, you know, it, most of the time, I mean, I can honestly say that most of the time that, that it works and then the kid, you know, will calm down and, you know, maybe it's just that they needed to talk, maybe there was just something going on, 
Um, maybe they were upset with the teacher for some reason in that classroom. Um, it could be anything. Great. Thank you, Chris. Um, by the way, these are excellent questions, and uh, it's pretty obvious to us sitting around the table here that uh, you're on the front lines. You are asking the questions. You're working with the kids day in and day out because they seem to be coming out of real-life situations uh, that you're involved in. And so thank you so much for your thoughtfulness in, in sending these questions our way. Um, Jessica asks, uh, how do you feel, uh, and this is to Chris, how do you feel that the PBS data is best shared with staff at all levels, and is there a particular subset of data that you found most helpful to staff to be, to be aware of? Uh, the critical outcome measures would be the most important. Um, what, what we do, especially, like if the superintendents, as I, as I talked about earlier, the superintendents try to make a point to um, just, just take that data and, and meet with small groups. So they'll sit down in a, in a circle with, that, with a small group of staff um, and they'll go over that data and they'll look at the data and they'll discuss it. And, you know, if something has increased, they might, they'll ask the staff, why do you think this, this has increased? What, what's going on? What's, what's happened in the facilities to make, to make these numbers go up? And then that gives that little group um, an, an opportunity to discuss it. And then after that group's done, then maybe they'll have pull another smaller group together. So it's really just being able to get out there, spend time with the staff, showing them the information. Another way that we present information is during what we call our staff assembly, staff recalls. Um, might be where as many staff can be in one room at one time and we put the data up on the computer and we show them. We do a lot of that also so that um, we can, you know, especially when it comes to the, to the surveys too, because we always want to make sure that if the staff are filling out surveys, that they're seeing the responses from the surveys and they're seeing actions taken from those surveys. So if they have ideas and um, they're putting, maybe they, maybe for example, that they put something on there that they need additional training in one area, then we can, you know, if we see a lot of that, then obviously we're going to try to implement training in that specific area. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's all about sharing, sharing that data and making sure that, that they all know. Um, with the youth climate surveys is, is another thing that we share because we want the staff to know, especially if the kids have, um, or and the exit interviews. So if the kids have positive things to say about staff or about the facility and their experience, we want to definitely get that out there. Uh, for those not familiar with uh, performance-based standards, what uh, Chris is referring to um, are the surveys. There are, when the data is collected twice yearly, there are surveys for the youth, surveys for the staff, and surveys for the families. These are climate surveys. and um, the, when a youth leaves the facility, there's an exit uh, survey uh, that, they, that is administered to the youth, and that informs uh, a number of the outcome measures. Also, she mentioned the critical outcome measures. When we were developing uh, performance-based standards, we looked at, so what, what of these outcomes and standards jump out at you as really uh, that have to be done? Um, they, they deal with the, the uh, life, health, and safety of kids and staff in the facilities. And also, they'll get you in trouble <laughs> with the Justice Department if you're not following them. So use of restraints, suicide attempts, um, use of isolation, these are, so there are many more. There are about 31 of them, I think, uh, Brendan. Brendan's shaking his head, so he knows. Um, there are 31 of them, and uh, they are what's called the critical outcome measures. Um, I, I have a question. Uh, uh, one of the things that we've been talking about a lot is, well, should there be an outside limit on the use, on um, how long isolation should last? Um, I know um, many of you, it's hard to put an outside limit on. Um, people try to get kids out in 15 minutes and PBS requires um, that the event be recorded if it goes beyond 15 minutes. Um, but I've noticed that some facilities are trying to advise their staff to, to uh, have the youth out in less than two hours, less than three hours, less than four hours. And by the way, PBS also measures youth uh, leaving four hours or uh, coming out of isolation four hours or less or eight hours or less. So I just want to throw out to, to um, the three of you, 
Uh, do you have uh, any set limits? I know there are set limits of when you will get higher authority signing off on it, but are there any outside limits uh, to the use of isolation, uh, Peter? We were careful not to put an outside limit on it, although the way we're operating right now, it's very rare that kids are in their rooms beyond an hour at, at all. Um, we do see that periodically. Um, and the way we, we accounted for that was a staircase effect where once you get to a certain point, you have to ask for the program level manager has to ask for permission for the next set of time. And that essentially polices itself. It shares the responsibility. And we ask for clinical intervention and then above the program clinical intervention so that you're, you're really problem solving at the agency level if you have a kid that's been in his room for several hours. But we were really careful not to put an outside limit into the policy. Uh, so I'm not sure if anybody else has. Yeah. Chris? Yeah, no, we don't, we don't have any set time limits. I mean, obviously, we would like to not use it at all, but we do realize that there are times where it, it really is necessary. Right. And uh, before I ask fair boys, um, uh, th those who participate in performance-based standards, they do get the average uh, duration. That's one of the, I think I've hit all four standards now, the uh, duration of, uh, the average duration of uh, isolation. And so therefore, even though you may not set an outside uh, limit, you are able to monitor that and, and bring it down, as Peter was just saying, how they've been able to bring it down. And, and you did too, Chris and, and Fairboys. So, but I, let me just ask Fairboys as well. Do you have an outside limit, Fairboys? Well, you know, there is, by policy, um, outside limit is actually in days. It's no more than five days of isolation. Our average, and most of our kids are not in isolation any more than, you know, less than 24 hours. So the majority of our youth actually don't even get close to that. But that is, ultimately, I think, I don't know if that limit came from OJJDP, but we do have that within our policy. Yeah. Yeah, if I could, if I could add one more thing too, I kind of remembered something as Fairbors was talking, but um, you know, for our disciplinary process, if that does happen, we can't keep anyone in for longer than three days. Okay. But it very rarely does it ever get to that you know three day point. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, well, this is a good one because it's the flip side of um, the use of isolation. Uh, Carrie asks. Have you found that there are some youth that prefer to stay in their rooms? Is this allowed? For example, if the kids are in a general area participating in activities, but some kids ask to stay in their rooms, is this allowed? Or what interventions do you use to encourage them to leave their rooms and join the rest of the, the uh, population? Peter? That's another excellent question. You know, and one of the, again, my experience is not going to be everybody else's experience. We took this on at a particular time for a particular reason, and we were really um, focused on involuntary room confinement. And throughout that process, we, we spilled over into the whole voluntary issue. If a kid is asking to go in their room, we don't allow that during school hours. We don't allow kids to opt out of clinical groups and sit in their rooms. We don't allow that during a week and, and programming hours during the week. On a Sunday afternoon, if a 17-year-old wants to go into his room and write a letter to his girlfriend or to his family, we allow for that. Um, and I think that's healthy for a 17-year-old boy or girl to have some privacy, particularly for these kids that are in institutions. It's, privacy is really uh, special and precious. So we, w we were very careful not to over-regulate and, and limit the ability for, particularly on a, on a Saturday or a Sunday afternoon, for example, where you have some downtime and someone wants to go in their room or they want to separate themselves from the group so that they can just kind of turn the volume down. I think that's very healthy and we allow for that. Okay. Um, I think, oh, here's a last question for Chris. Um, uh, Stacy asked, how does the staff shadowing affect your staffing levels? I guess it means you're pulling a staff away from your from their day-to-day uh, -day activities to to do um, to be uh, to be a shot um, to be shadowed rather. Yeah, <laughs> um, we 
I mean, it, it, it's actually, it's not, it doesn't, we don't have to use it very often, but we do. Um, it is, it, it obviously is going to affect our staffing, but, um, but I, I'll be honest with you, we haven't, the, as many times as, as we've used it, we've probably only had one or two kids at a time, so it's not really impacted as, as much as you would think it would. Okay. Yeah, we haven't got to the point to where we would need it for that many, which is good, but, and I, I hope that we won't get to that level. Great. Okay, we have about four minutes left, so um, just before we wrap up, uh, let me just open it to um, Peter, uh, Chris, and Fairboys. Are, are there any final comments you'd like to make to the group? I just, I, I'm very encouraged that there's that many people on this call, and uh, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough uh, subject or a tough um, task to take on, but it's worth doing, and uh, I, I wish you the best and hope we can be helpful along the way here. Chris? Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree. Um, I think, as I said earlier, don't try to make a lot of changes all at once, but, but make your changes, and, and it'll, it'll change your culture, and you will see, you will see tr tremendous Im improvement. So good, good luck to everyone. Uh, fair boys? Um, well, you know, clearly agree with everything that Peter and Chris said. Um, you know, I think this is a learning process for all of us. And the key point of this, um, again, you know, just trying to stay ahead of the curve so that this does not become a mandate. Because if we become curious about what works or what does not work, we'll be much more creative than when we're trying to comply with a mandate. So within the organization, outside the organization, I think just being proactive and staying ahead of this thing. Chris was talking about data collection. And, you know, Peter was talking about the importance of actually collecting the data. And um, to, the more that we can get our staff engaged in that, the more that they can actually become curious as to why did the number go up or why did it go down versus this is a target that we have to hit. You know, um, becoming curious is a much better way of resolving issues than just simply responding to somebody who's watching over your shoulder. Yeah, I agree with Peter. This is a very tough um, issue, and, you know, we hope to learn and to continue to share as we go along. Thank you, Fair Boys. Well, that concludes our, our webinar. I, I just want to thank our, our presenters, uh, Fair Boys. Uh, Chris and Peter, uh, these are extraordinarily busy people. They are uh, real contributors to CJCA, and um, you can tell that they've given this uh, much thought, and it's resulted in terrific action in their jurisdictions, and they've become models. They and some others have become models for the rest of the field. Um, I want to thank Brendan Donahue, our, um, our producer of the webinar. Uh, Brendan is, is wrapping up a PBS cycle, um, the, uh, pre the uh, site uh, data collection, and he's wrapping it up today, I think. And so he's been extraordinarily busy. And, the, and when I told him the date, he uh, went white, but he said, I'll, I'll get it done, don't worry. And so I want to thank Brendan for, uh, as always, running just a very professional um, webinar. And Michael Lumpierre, who um, is working with CJCA right now, and Michael, um, worked on putting this this together and, and did a terrific job. I want to give a shout out to Lisa Hutchinson, who is the project coordinator for CCAS, and Elizabeth Wolf, who is the OJJDP um, oversight person for the uh, CCAS grant. They both have been very uh, helpful in, in allowing CJCA to move in this direction um, of trying to help the field reduce the use of isolation. Uh, there is, uh, so just to Put it all together. Uh, that last slide up there. These are the five steps that are in the toolbook, in the toolkit, rather, um, and so that we uh, that there be a re rehabilitative mission statement and philosophy. Um, that there that restrictive isolation policies uh, and proceed that there are restrictive isolation um, policies and procedures uh, to identify data to manage, monitor, and be accountable for the use of isolation. Uh, the fourth is to develop alternative behavior management options and responses. And then the last, but not the least at all, is to train and develop staff and agency mission, 
values, standards, goals, policies, and procedures. And I think we heard that today of these three jurisdictions that are really putting these five steps into practice. And again, they're in the toolkit. And uh, if you um, want, to, uh, want to download the toolkit and you haven't done that yet, there it is right up on the, uh, on the screen. It's uh, cjca.net. Go under Publications and uh, you can download the toolkit. And uh, it says that it's, uh, it's a um, copyrighted material, but you all have permission to distribute it widely. <laughs> we really want this uh, toolkit to be distributed and that you use it as you develop your plans to reduce the, the use of isolation. So with that, again, I want to thank all of you who participated today. We know you carved out time on a Friday afternoon um, before a, a weekend, and uh, we are grateful that you have the interest. And if indeed we can be helpful to you, um, you can send an email to info at cjca.net. That's info at cjca.net. And we'll try to either connect you with someone who can help you or get back to you and, and answer whatever question you have, you have especially in the area of where, where you can get resources or can get assistance in uh, reducing the use of isolation. So again, thanks very much. We're about a minute over, but thank you very much, everybody, and have a great weekend. Drive safely if you're driving somewhere tonight.